All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, my name is David Koch. I'm the audience marketing manager here at Relative Insight. Um, we're here today for our Relatively Speaking webinar event, a panel discussion on the topic of text analytics and the future of business intelligence. Uh, just in terms of logistics for the session today, uh, we're going to be aiming to have about 40 minutes structured Q&A with our panel. Um, and then we'll be moving into Q&A from the audience for the last 20 minutes. So please do submit your questions um, as the session goes along through the Q&A function. If your question's for a specific person, um, please do mention that. Uh, and we'll do our best to get to all those questions as we go through. Uh, as always, we'll be recording this session and we'll be sending it around a recording uh, following the session. And with that, um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our wonderful panel uh, for today's session. So we have joining us Miriam Bisvari from Sky. We have Mike Van Wick uh, from Capital Group, and we have Megan Phillips from RGA. Uh, and moderating today's session is going to be uh, Relative Insights CEO, um, Ben Hookway. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Ben uh, to get us started. I just said that, thanks very much, David. And, and then that was my first amateur mistake by not taking myself off mute. <laughs> so hello, everybody. Um, as David said, I'm Ben Hookway. I'm the CEO of Relative Insight. Um, and it's a, a real thrill to have you all joining us today and a real thrill to have our esteemed panelists, uh, all of whom are Relative Insight customers. Um, and I am very excited um, for what's gonna be, I think, a fantastic session. Um, I love talking to our customers uh, for all, all kinds of reasons. Um, I love sort of talking to them to understand their world, understand their pressures, understanding the sort of wider role that they play in their business. And I also like talking to them to try and understand what's coming down the line for them. And, and so we can understand what's coming, what the innovations that they think are most important and so on and so on. So, um, and that's really what we're going to try and attempt today virtually. Um, we're doing it across a lot of time zones. So uh, Mike is in Los Angeles. So it's only just gone seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and he looks much, much better than me, even though it's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon where I am. Uh, we got Miriam, who's in London, and then Megan's in New York. Um, and it's a great panel because we got, you know, two, you know, two brands, like one big consumer, one big financial services. And then we've also got one of the leading agencies in, in marketing analytics, in my view, in RGA. So we're going to get a really good spread of opinion and pressures on people, actually, when it comes to analytics. Um, so in order to get going, um, we're going to get a little bit of an introduction. But what we're going to do is that um, each panelist is going to obviously introduce themselves, but then sort of give us an idea of the environment they work in, uh, who their insights that they generate are usually used by, who their stakeholders are, um, and, un and try and understand how they fit in with the business. And they don't know which order I'm gonna do this in. So uh, we're just gonna do it by the order they, they come on my screen. So uh, Miriam, you are the first one up. I was gonna say, shall I volunteer? <laughs> I'm that type. Um, I'm Miriam Visvari. I work for Sky. I don't know if um, there are people from different countries here that, in terms of audience, who don't know who, that what Sky does. So Sky is a, a, a huge company in the UK. It's part of the Comcast family um, that that also has NBC Universal. We provide TV, broadband. Uh, we sell mobile phones as well. So we've got a, we've got a really really good strong business in the UK. I look after applied analytics. That means basically data science, analytics, um, insights even, lots of predictive stuff, lots of um, uh, proactively engaging our customers and identifying how we can make the Sky experience a better experience. And in terms of who my stakeholders are, who isn't my stakeholder is, is probably a better question. I pretty much view the entire company as my stakeholders just because we sit in a central role, uh, in a central team, and we, we really try and help 
everybody. So my main ones, if I want to call out, some of them are the MD4 broadband, the MD4 TV. The most recent one, which is very exciting for me, is um, the CEO of uh, Sky Studios. So, you know, so what content uh, we should look at, what's exciting for people, uh, how do we compare to other companies like, Net like Netflix and Amazon Prime in terms of content. So th those are the big ones I want to um, I want to call out. Fantastic, thanks. So I think we'll probably go in time zone order. So uh, we'll probably get to, to Megan now. All right, hi everyone. Um, I am Megan Phillips. I am an executive director of data and marketing sciences at RGA. So RGA is a um, kind of a digital innovation agency uh, based in New York, but we have a global footprint. And um, we work with a, a range of different clients. I would say primarily my stakeholders are in the marketing department. Um, typically in a more senior level, we're, we're engaging with clients um, usually in capacities of evolution of their marketing. So what is the best way they can engage with their customers who are new customer bases and targets they should be thinking about. So less you know, executional campaigns and more about really trying to broaden who, you know, who they are and, and the conversations they have with consumers. Um, because of that, sometimes we are talking to tech teams if we're trying to activate data that isn't typically activated for them. Um, innovation teams, if some brands have those, um, it depends. We're working a lot with um, sort of like newer, um, new economy brands, we like to call them. So you think of like an Uber or Reddit, um, or brands like that, Tonal, all, there's a, quite a few that are um, sort of architected a bit differently because they're a much newer generation of brand. So those, um, you know, the stakeholders there might be slightly different. And then internally, you know, as, as my discipline sits, we are part of um, a larger kind of strategic department. So we have two other uh, strat partners in our group, which is, you know, sort of the more traditional brand strategy and then a team called Connections, which is really sort of the bridge between the work we do and say a media agency that we might work with. So they're really fluent in platforms and the ways in which consumers are using different platforms and the best sort of practices there. And so we consider, of course, those, those teams to be internal stakeholders and then teams like our creative teams, since we're really kind of providing them with the foundations and the insights that help sort of jumpstart their creativity and allow them to produce all the awesome work that they produce. So a bit of a bifurcated stakeholder situation, but can, that's you, it. can you sort of name, uh, I think it might, might be useful for uh, maybe the, the viewers to understand the sort of brands that RGA work for actually it would be really sure. Bad. Yeah, of course. So we have a pretty large range. We have, um, you know, I guess what you would consider to be, you know, blue chip, well-known brands, um, something that I worked on for years and years, um, Samsung. So um, at the global level across a couple of different business units that they have. So we work with mobile, we'll work with computing, we'll work with um, more of their, con you know, smaller consumer electronic brands and products in there. We work with Verizon quite a bit um, here in the U.S. We have, again, um, on the West Coast, Nike is a is a client that we're very proud of and had a very long-standing relationship with out of our Portland office. Our Cal California office does a lot with those new economy brands. You think of, again, like a Reddit. Um, we had a really awesome uh, Super Bowl activation with them and then the kind of relationship there had taken off in a really productive way. Um, we work with Sonic, um, you know, the food, the fast food chains. I don't know for you guys in the UK if that's a known thing, but um, Sonic, Michael's, the craft store. So we have a fairly big range um, of brands. I know there are many more that are escaping me right now. Um, so it does fluctuate between sort of these really big incumbent brands that are looking to either stay relevant or find ways to continue to adjust as the consumer footprint changes. And, you know, millennials and Gen Z, of course, become the biggest priority. And then we have brands who were born for that gener those generations and how, you know, you continue to evolve and grow with them as they go from smaller companies, you know, to much larger and really kind of hit their stride. Right. Fantastic. Mike, tell us about hey, that. Absolutely. So I'm pleased to say the sun has broken over the hills behind my house. So the day has officially begun in Los Angeles, um, which, uh, which feels good. 
So I introduce myself, um, Mike Van Wyk. I lead the customer research and insights team at Capital Group. And for those who aren't familiar with Capital Group, it is one of the world's largest asset managers, uh, 2.6 trillion or so assets under management. That's trillion with a T. Um, and we're a company that it's primarily business to business focused. And so we focus on financial professionals with our products and they then distribute our investment to the end customer. And with those financial professionals, we are the number one most trusted brand in the US and one of the top five most trusted brands globally. Um, so Capital Group, great company to work for. I've been here for six years. Prior to that, 17 years with Procter & Gamble. And at Procter & Gamble, I also worked uh, studying consumer behavior. As far as uh, my stakeholders, it's interesting. When I came to Capital Group, um, one of the things that I asked is who wouldn't want to understand their customer? And I really worked to broaden out the way that our team was working across Capital Group. And so we work not just with the marketers, not just with the sales force. Um, we also work with those who are making investment decisions. And we work with PR in creating some content platforms that we take then externally. And we work with a team that actually serves as an internal consulting group that interacts with our end customers. So very broad in terms of the way that we work uh, across the internal stakeholders. What's different is with each of those stakeholders, we work differently. So with the investment professionals, those who are making investment decisions, we tend to support them with these narrow slices of information on the market or on the end uh, consumers or the products and the companies that they are looking to make evaluation decisions against. For marketers, of course, we try to inspire um, our marketing campaigns with great core insights and then improve them with feedback on how those campaigns are doing and then connecting with our end customers. Um, so it's different in every situation, what we are bringing forward, how we're interacting internally, um, but really it's very, very broad in terms of the way that we're woven into the business. So uh, I know, I'm gonna get used to the mute button. Um, so I think maybe we, we jump off here with maybe uh, trends actually. Um, I think, uh, you know, Megan, you, you touched on, um, you know, new brands coming into the market with maybe a, a D to C direct to consumer model um, that's having an effect on how kind of all the more established brands are thinking about uh, their positioning. But it also sort of fundamentally changes the amount of data and the sort of type of data which is available. And so, you know, if you're a, a D to C brand, you've got a lot more first party data coming in. Um, which you can utilize in all kinds of ways. Um, and we're also, you know, in relative insights customers, we're, we're seeing this replicated. We're seeing customer experience or CX data uh, being used a lot now in consumer insights. Um, and I was just thinking, um, uh, Miriam, this is like, this probably touches on Sky quite a lot. So I was wondering if you could talk about maybe over the last few years, the sort of changes in the demands for the types of analytics that you're, yeah. th that you're being asked for, and maybe the different um, sources of data for that too. Yes, well, if we're increasingly going outwards more and more, right? So we know our own internal data and, and we know what we've got, we know what we know about our customers, but we've been, up until recently, we've been pretty much blind in terms of the rest of the world right competitors especially or even things like customer perception how do customers talk about uh, sky our brand our products and that's where the value of the external data has come in and text analytics specifically when we do this a lot we we, we look at things like you know how do people talk about our content what they like what they don't like uh, what's important for content so just even generic questions not necessarily specific sky stuff or or looking at uh, netflix um but just generic question one of the questions was you know what do people like about um, uh, dramas miniseries what are the things what are the themes and that is different that is so new and so exciting at the same time i love it you know we we, we didn't know that camera work was uh, what was important I, I could see claire in the in the audience so i'm sure she's nodding nodding along because <laughs> she told me camera work is important now and i was like wow i didn't realize that and you wouldn't know that until you know you look at people's language so text analytics is increasingly more and more used and I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it personally interesting and, and are your stakeholders um 
are they absorbing that kind of data? Like if, 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 they're, if they've been in the business for a while, they're used to seeing uh, quant data. Yeah. So, um, metrics going up and down and so on. Um, it's a, it's a journey. They, put it that way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a journey. And I think uh, there's always a question of, is that is that an indicator? Is that a fact? You know, how many how many people think camera work is important? You know, so so who did we look at? And those things are really hard to quantify. So you're right when it comes to the the, the quantitative versus the, quali the versus the qualitative. That's a really hard sell. Um, yeah. And I always position it as this is an indicator. It's not a here it is. This is this is pointers. You know, so. If, for me, I use text analytics to give me the insight in terms of where to look, what to look at, what are the things that matter, look at patterns, but not look at it as um, an exact science. Right, okay. So, um, so Megan, um, when you're, you know, I guess same question to you. I think, I think this, is, this is kind of quite interesting. And so it's not just like the, um, the varieties of data and the different demands on the insight, but also the, the receptivity, I think, of the audience of who needs to hear it and, and what, what you're seeing in the, in the agency world. Yeah, well, I think actually Miriam summarized it really nicely when she said, like, from a first party data perspective, like, you know what you know, right? I think brands have a very good sense a lot of brands have a very good sense of the data that they have. And so they understand patterns on their on their platforms or they understand sales and this sort of thing. But they don't necessarily embrace external data in the same way um, as being a valuable indicator or a way to augment sort of why those performance numbers are looking as they are. And so that's a big place where we've been able to provide a lot of value to our brands I'm thinking specifically of an assignment that we had with Samsung where they were um, looking to create a new uh, global brand, brand platform, excuse me. And, and um, of course they have all the market data and they understand in which markets and sort of like why people are leaning towards and you know an op, uh, Apple versus uh, you know their operating system or if it's a different kind of Android device. But they were very much staying in that space of, of um, the full quant data where it's like, here's the market and like, here's what's selling by device, et cetera. And so where we really came in and, and you know, shameless plug for you guys, but use relative insights quite a bit was to really um, like unpack exactly why that was like, what were the cultural norms happening in these markets that made, you know, unfortunately for Samsung Android, like not cool. Like in the U S it's not cool to have the green bubble in your friend chat when everyone else is on iMessage with the blue and there, you know, for each market that we looked at and it was multi-market, we were able to dig in and really start to understand sort of these underlying currents from conversations and, and from any kind of shared text. Again, like we love any long form content and that's where your tool is awesome. Um, so something like a Reddit or any kind of tech platforms where people are talking about operating systems, you really can start to pull out really interesting findings that may not be the exact reason, again, sort of like where Miriam was going, the exact causal reason of why this is going this way, but they're really important trends that you need to understand. So you can either adjust your product or change around your platform so it's easier, or simply change your comms and start to explain in your brand messaging and start to attack some of those challenges in a way where you overcome some of those barriers. So that's really the value that we've been bringing a lot with um, sort of the text uh, analytics that we've been, you know, kind of leveraging and sharing out with our clients. So that's that's great, thanks. Um, I mean, Mike, I think you're in your role you got something of a, a trickier thing somehow in, in that in also in bringing your products to market you're more you're more of a b2b channel so you a lot of your role is to sort of i guess persuade and convince other financial professionals that they're doing it wrong and there might be a better way to do it um can you sort of sort of talk about that journey and, and kind of what data you know you tend to use in in that and what tends to persuade people yeah, so our, our products are basically wrappers around investments that financial professionals then use with their end uh, with their end clients. And so often what we're doing is we are trying to influence those financial professionals. And actually some major work we've done recently is actually on the basis of trying to consult with and how they can grow their business. 
their methods in order to do that. And that's different. That's something that maybe is a small element um, of what we did at PNG. It's it's a major element of what we do at Capital Group. So it's a very different approach that we take. And as we bring that knowledge forward, we have to be in touch with the market. And so the traditional research methods we use, they certainly bring in the ability to understand how brands are performing, how they're positioned, how they're connecting with the different clients. But we like using unstructured data and text analytics to open up the lens wider and to see how things are evolving. Because it's in those organic conversations, those more unstructured conversations, that new opportunities come forward. And to be able to recognize them, to be able to organize them and understanding of them and then bring that forward to our external clients, that gives us an edge from a thought leadership standpoint. An example would be just seeing how people are talking about the way that they're experiencing retirement, how they're preparing for retirement, um, how they're thinking about that as a future milestone if they're younger in life. That's evolving dramatically around the globe, being in touch with that and using more unstructured data sources in order to do that allows us to really, again, have that thought leadership edge and really provide value to the customers that we work with. Mike, can I can I jump in, Ben? I was just going to say it's great to hear that from you because I spent a lot of time in um, commercial insurance and, you know, text analytics was just non-existent because, firstly, they were just hammered with regulatory requests. That where that's where most of the effort went. So very little for innovation for things where they can change. But then, secondly, the, there weren't many value add opportunities. You know, so the the where do you how can you use text analytics to add value i think for commercial insurance that was definitely a challenge so i i love what you just said that there are areas for, for sure there are thank you so in terms of i mean since you're like so keen to talk about text analytics i guess let's talk about text analytics um so can we talk a little bit about sources of data right so th there's obviously a lot of you know, unstructured, text-heavy data floating around most corporations, and that, and the, you know, the whole sort of reason Relative Insight exists is that that text data represents normally represents the answer to the question why something is happening. So we tend to view quant data as being what is happening, but text data quite often tells you why stuff is happening. Um, but it can be tricky, and people are going to you know, glaze over if they see another word cloud or, you know, so it, it can be quite tricky. And obviously we, we, we're a lot better than that. Um, what we're seeing constantly now is a lot more, you know, an evolution actually in, in text analytic data sources. So, and obviously we, you know, we, we absorb a lot of like social media listening data and, uh, but we recently like a lot of open end surveys are uh, coming in uh, so we're seeing a lot of our customers actually rethinking how they structure surveys and they're putting in more open-end questions because now they can practically sort of analyze them. Uh, but obviously review sites um, are, are really big. Um, and, and, and some really interesting things recently around um, transcribed data. So we've had a few things coming up where uh, there's a lot of uh, platforms out there to help uh, sales uh, forces, some of those sales and, and some of those platforms record calls and then transcribe the calls, and you can then use obviously relative insight to to understand what's the difference between a good outcome call and a bad outcome call. So that's voice being transcribed to text because you know as the in, as people understand that text is valuable, they will go and get more of a valu valuable thing, and so now we're seeing a lot of transcribed stuff. So. Um, can you maybe talk about the sources of, of, of text data that, that you're doing a lot of the analysis on and, and where you see things going on that? Let's start with Miriam, I guess. I figured, I figured you'd start with me. <laughs> We're in a loop, aren't we? Um, so I focus mostly on external data sets at the moment. As you said, social media is the big one for me. So that's, that's the number one priority. And mainly because it's so new and we know so little I'm really, really keen to understand the, the, that that natural language of how people talk about the brands, as I said, any issues that they're experiencing, um, and and mainly about content. So I, I mentioned the you know the comparisons to to our competitors and, and what is it people want to watch, right? So th that is the biggest focus for me. But I did think, and we're not doing this, so um, unfortunately, but. 
I would love to uh, get the synopsis better. So if I could transcribe the entire film, right? And we do that because the subtitles are there, right? So we, we do transcribe films. Um, but if I could then get a better synopsis from that, so rather than somebody typing it up, but a much more, here is what the film is about, I would love to do that. That would be my, my ideal next project. Okay. Speech to text. Noted. Um, Mike, what, what have you been um, sort of using for, for, for sources in, in your analytics? Yeah, you can really put it into three buckets, I think. The first is um, the comments that we get in response to the service that we provide to financial professionals or end investors as people are interacting with us, um, in the calls that they have with us or in the feedback they provide, that gives us this huge set of data that we can then analyze and we can find whether or not we're delivering against their expectations and how we can improve. And so that's one great source and it's really designed to improve our service and our uh, interaction with them in that context, but it can be applied more broadly depending on the findings that come out. The second, as Miriam mentioned, social media, it's a great source for us and there's where you can go out and you can find some of those conversations that are taking place organically. And what I find that primarily does is it just opens our lens wider to understand some of the trends that exist out there that maybe we weren't as connected to. And then the final is research led. And actually I find it most useful to do it in an intentional way to collect a large quantity um, of communication, a large quantity of text that you can put into a transcript and then you can do analytics against it. And that could be um, an open-end question where that's the entire purpose of the interaction with an end respondent, where you ask a very broad open question to start and then you ask what else, what else, what else? and you have them just talk at some length on a particular topic, you can use then transcripts to capture that and then text analytics to analyze that plus the other responses you have and put together kind of an architecture of how conversations flow, which you can then apply into a lot of different situations, how you structure other research and how you understand how you should communicate um, on that topic externally and internally. Right. And so Megan, I mean, I know you, I'm familiar with some of the sources you've got, um, so I know you do a lot of um, social stuff, um, but you're not moving very much. So I assume you've frozen up a bit. So until we'll wait till Megan comes back. So we'll carry on. It's like Survivor. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so maybe we'll sort of... Um, switch gears and look at maybe the future. So um, Miriam, you, in your intro, you, you, you sort of hinted at some sort of predictive type stuff. I have big ambitions for text analytics. Yeah, so I mean, you, you know this, Ben, right? So I'm a big, big fan, as you know. Um, and um, I, I do think the future is going to be, I'm waiting for the day when we have a machine chatting like this. And I firmly believe that's possible, right? With machine learning, with, you know, even to the point where the intonation will be correct, where the responses will be correct, just based on machine learning. I can't see how that cannot be done. We've got the tools, we've got, you know, we've, we've got the abilities just now, the application of it, right? That will be a totally different question of where do you use it, where do you apply? But, and, and it happens with, you know, already chatbots obviously talking back at you that there's no intonation that there's no speech there or when you hear these speeches at the moment they tend to be very robotic mind you alexa is getting it better right so <laughs> or, or some other tools out there but i do believe that in the future we will be able to have conversations with with a machine because the machine would have learned here's the topic here's the answers or the set of answers yeah. so it, and it is um i mean we're starting to see some customers um using uh time comparisons quite extensively to uncover uh, differences, you know, week to week, day to day, month to month in, in, in a lot of the things actually Mike talked about, which are kind of like wider trends. So just like, how do people talk about financial planning? You know, that data set, and then seeing that over time, uh, if there's significant differences over time, then it can be the beginning of a trend. So it can be that sort of predictive, predictive element. Um, are, are there any examples of that in Sky that you can actually that you can talk about or would like to sort of highlight? Not not at the moment, but I do think the the first use case that I would apply this this uh, 
predictive speech <laughs> is um, is my, my children are on the spectrum, and I talk very openly about how they struggle to communicate with you know just chit chat just generally so that would be a fantastic use case for this right fantastic use case to go right here's a tool that will help you how to talk to people um yeah and and, and what about that that would be my my yeah. passion project uh, yeah to, I mean, yeah i mean we, we've often thought about um in, in our downside of, of like text text analytics fantasy league um you know we can people communicate differently on different apps on their device right people will communicate differently depending on whether they're on a phone or an ipad or a, or a laptop people i think that you know the aspect of the way voice is going to come on i think you know i'm quite new to alexa but now i've got two of them in the house and you know they're getting a lot of conversation and if that really does evolve then search isn't a kind of you know one in two word a conversation anymore right it is a conversation yeah. and then yeah so and why can't we get to the point where entire emails will be written for us right at the moment you get the the predictive text the predictive sentences you started to get those in um in 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 apps and um on devices so i'm sure it's going to get to the point where it will be an entire email and i just have to review it and press send that would be fantastic right what a time saver yeah I mean, Mike, so Mike, are you, are you getting much demand for like like more predictive um, uh, analytics from your stakeholders? Yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky question to ask within financial services because you know you're making investment choices for this yeah. standpoint of predicting the future value of things. And That's so, why I asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> For investment professionals, they are working with teams that have an advanced analytics capability. That's actually outside of the work that I do. And so from the standpoint of predicting where the markets are going to go or investment choices, um, we have deep capability there. It's a little bit outside of what I touch within the work that I do specifically. Then, you know, there's this idea of more predicting how human behavior is shifting when it interacts with, you know, our industry and our business model. And from that standpoint, um, you know, we have this great advanced analytics team that we work with that is working with some of the passive data sets that, you know, they, they just predict the trend forward in terms of the investment choices that people are making and really what they're trying to invest for. And it's that underlying need that's so important for us to understand because that need is what we can take, we can pick up and we can communicate about with those that are trying to influence, again, both internally and then externally as we're working in a consultative manner with the financial professionals that we work with. So it is from that standpoint um, that there's more involvement from my role and the work that I do. And again, what I would say that we're trying to discover is the underlying need and how that need is shifting. And it's actually a really interesting time to be talking about that because the last two years, and think of what's gone on with COVID-19, what you've seen is this collapse. And so things that may have taken five or 10 years to fully come to play in terms of how people have changed their behavior from the obvious, like the fact that we're doing this via video, that everyone's used to the video conferencing, uh, work from home and things like that, to some things that are a little bit less obvious in terms of the way that people are more independent in their access and use of information and many lenses across their life, it's really collapsed. And so those needs have evolved really quickly and that's made businesses have to be on their toes to be in touch with what's changing and then to take the meaning from it and begin to apply it. So fascinating time, frankly, to be talking about uh, really yeah. being able to connect to those trends and apply them to the business. Yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting. So we, we've seen, a, I mean, there's a few sort of like big macro topics that I think a lot of our customers keep um, time-based comparisons going on, right? So um, how people talk about actually financial planning, financial independence, um, both in terms of job insecurity and maybe working at home options and do they want to do this? So a lot that's, that's been moving really quick. Um, the other two really big ones, um, uh, ESG, so sustainability. Um, uh, Megan's power is now back on. So Megan- Sorry, it's like, okay. of course, of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, so a sustainability and ESG um, is, is another one which, um, you know, obviously, a lot of, you know, most big companies are, are, are paying a lot of attention to it, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of changes 
um, quite rapid changes actually in how society even talks about ESG and sustainability. Uh, and we're seeing quite big divergences actually between say like the way ESG is discussed in the States compared to the UK is actually quite fundamentally different as well. Um, and, then right. the, the, and then the third one is, is, is the, you know, of course it has to be Gen Z or Gen Z. Um, and that's just nonstop, you know? Um, so. Yeah. And I'd say absolutely on all of those. Um, and so just commenting quickly on ESG, it's, you know, in the world of finance, that's a key topic. And what's been interesting with that one is ESG, for those who aren't familiar with it, environmental, sustainability, governance type investing. So investing, many people would say investing based on your values. That has spiked as a topic of interest about every five years for maybe the past 20 years in the US and it's always faded. Globally, it's actually gained traction and become much more fundamental to the way people look at investments. And the question in the US was whether that's really going to happen. And so it's one of those examples of trying to understand a trend that's developing and whether that's happening. And I argue there's a variety of methods that you use. It's Mike's time. Going down like skittles, aren't we? <laughs> so, you, you, so you would say what one of the other um, um, techniques being used, Mike, and then you cut out a little bit. Ah, sorry about that. I was just saying that multiple methods need to be applied to really understand how that's going to move forward. And then the other thing is, what are the regulatory uh, circumstances that will encourage it to move forward or at least sustain its momentum? Um, is the other thing that we, we certainly take a look at and incorporate. Right. Okay. So, uh, Megan, just before you like had to find the fuse box. Um, so I, I was asking you about, we'll just cover off the question I was just asking you before it all went away. And that was like, like can you like quickly outline the text sort of data sources you tend to use? And then, and then what we were just talking about was kind of like where we think it's all going to go. Like where's, where, where's the destination uh, of, of text analytics? Okay, um, well, the first part is definitely easier. So so for the sources, we've seen um, in a short amount of time, a, a pretty big advancement in where we've been pulling from. So, I mean, from a from an agency perspective, very traditional, we were leaning on um, uh, uh, social listening and predominantly Twitter, as you know. So we're looking at very short sound bites triggered by a certain keyword and just getting these little snippets. and. When we first started doing that and when Twitter sort of became the platform to pull from, that was really helpful in terms of just getting a gauge on how consumers talked about brands, their like quick hit reactions to things and really like the polarized view of things. So you're only really gonna tweet if you're super happy or super angry about something. So you sort of got this spectrum of where people were sitting and reacting to your brand. But as, um, you know, like sort of the, the platforms evolved and there was just a proliferation of where people could share their thoughts and opinions, um, at RJ, we really liked to switch towards that, as I mentioned before, like longer form content. So we're looking at things like forums, um, Reddit, we love because there's just so much ongoing dialogue that's lengthy. So you can find your keyword snippet and get into that sentence, but really have a much broader context around what is driving that positive or reaction sentiment. Um, and then consumer reviews, which you mentioned before, Ben, as well, is that's very large. I mean, what so a lot of our brands have that, um, you know, a physical presence somewhere. So if you think of Nike, they have factory stores, they have a, a number of different physical retail locations. And so as we're starting to think about with them, how you blend an online to offline experience or how you start to focus comms in a more localized way for the specific stores. Those consumer reviews really allow you to fuel the understanding of what's happening in Chicago is not necessarily the experience that's happening in New York, that's happening in Miami. So it's really nice to be able to dig into reviews in that way. Um, and then, you know, it was mentioned before as well around survey um, open ends and sort of those like longer form questions, being able to apply a little more rigor to those responses has been really nice as well. So instead of just having our team sort of reading and sort of bucketing to leverage tools that allow you to sort of, you know, understand the key differences and really where things are popping has been another way we've sort of pushed our understanding of consumer response data. Right. 
Um, so, so I guess for the uh, everyone watching, we're, we're about to get into question time. Um, so if you haven't submitted a question yet, or you want to do so, please start thinking about that now. However, we also have, we have questions already, um, which I'm just going to start getting into now. Um, okay, so we've got a question from Mike. So how do you approach building better contextual understandings of how your audiences think and talk so that you can more commute so that you can communicate with them more effectively. I can, I can start on that. So we need to build up a picture, right? It's not, from my experience, the way I've approached it is we, we agree on a starting point, be it, okay, let's analyze Twitter or, or Instagram or some, some social media, and we just start understanding the, the pattern. So it's a specific, let's say broadband. We want to say, how do people talk about broadband, sky broadband? We use relative insight for this. I get lovely presentations back, um, which will then give me the, the trends, the patterns. So that's my starting point. And then we can drill down, we can look at, okay, what would be of most value, right? Or what's the easiest? What's, what, are, what is the quick win? And, and it takes time. It's definitely a right, let's look at this particular word or this particular um, sentence or issue and start to drill into it. And over time, you end up building up a picture of, of, of your uh, product, I guess, and, and how customers talk about it or whatever, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, in my case, content is the exciting one. So Mike, Mike, what about in financial services? I guess that yeah. might be quite complicated <laughs> because it could be, you know, what uh, the word interest, for instance, right. you know, that, that could be the incredibly intimidating word, or it could be a sort of, a, you know, yeah. a metric that a professional uses. So that's right. Our, our industry is, <clears throat> is plagued by language. Um, it, it's so complicated, it can be overwhelming, the language that's used. And the way that we try to approach that is we can um, go out and look at the organic conversations that are taking place in forums that are taking place in social media and we can look at as we can describe it just how people are really talking about the topic in the language that they're using and that can then inform the way that we construct our language and really simplify our language um, for use with both again financial professionals and you know the everyday consumers that we uh, interact with and develop content for and so we were using our ability to tap into those conversations to create simpler, clearer expression of what we're doing, the benefits we provide, and the benefits that the industry provides so people can connect to them and understand really what we mean. And that's one of the big values here. When we just go off and try to write things or communicate things in the clearest possible way, we can be our own worst enemy because we know the industry too well. We know what we're trying to communicate. You know the complexity behind it. But if you look for indicator words for that topic, and then you tap into the vast amount of conversation that's taking place and simplify it down to meet people where they are, explaining clearly whatever you're trying to communicate in the language that they're using, you're in a much, much better position. So it's actually the ability to access those conversations, use text analytics in order to analyze them and see how they, in certain contexts, the linkages between different topic areas and then simplify down into the language that everyday people use. Um, that's one of the great advantages. And it's, uh, it's certainly for us in a more complicated industry with language everywhere that gets in the way, it's one of the, uh, it's one of the distinct benefits. Yeah, I think yeah, every, every I, industry, every, every company has its own um, lexicon internally, which, <laughs> you know. I was gonna that. say, I can so relate to this, Mike, because the amount of times I was surprised just to understand actually the customer doesn't talk about it the same way we do um, because you take it for granted you're so close to it you're close to your products and you call them certain things you you know how they work you talk about them you know you talk about faults you talk about fiber and 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 understanding how the customer talks about it is exceptionally helpful right because it's as you said it helps you adjust your language it helps you understand them there's no point using this language they don't talk about it that way um, it, it can bring you much closer to your customers. 
Yeah. So, right, I got a specific question from Megan, and then uh, we've got some an interesting theme coming out of the poll that we ran at the beginning of the session. So I'll come on to that. So, Megan, um, so what approaches are you taking with your clients to help them continuously monitor and learn about their customers throughout their customer life cycle to ensure that they're realizing maximum value? Well, that's a good question. That's, a, um, that's, that's like an interview question. Uh, I know, I know. Um, so we've actually been doing a lot of work. Um, I like the life cycle question that went in. So we've been doing a lot of work recently. We're building out um, uh, what we're calling a relationship marketing practice at RGA. And, and it's a lot around um, life cycle. And so you, you have to understand one thing that we're working with our clients to highlight is that there are, you know, of course, stages and indicators across the way that um, they're going to vary. So for, uh, so I guess for tech specific to tech, so like for onboarding and when you think about really trying to ensure that you are delivering on expectations that you've essentially sold through all of your marketing efforts to say, you know, purchase this product or this service and we will deliver X. Um, there are certain moments and, and sort of timelines in that where you want to create um, feedback loops, right? And like really understand consumer reaction to ensure that you are delivering on that. Once you get people past that and they're into more of a usage or habit loop or however your brand wants to describe fully using it, there are, your feedback loop is going to change. And the way that you want to sort of monitor and um, and take in information to inform what, where the barriers are, where the hiccups are, where you need to refine and simplify, sort of like those questions you have to be asking change and the areas and the mechanisms that you capture that information needs to change. Um, and then of course, like win back after uh, a churn, you know, um, a customer churn is, is gonna be different as well. But anyway, so we do, um, try to work with our clients to ensure that there are specific feedback loops across like the journey so that you're making sure you understand if you're delivering on your promises and um, if you are, you know, effectively being able to remove barriers that are emerging. And we can do that through own. So like, are there actual moments within the platform or in the service or whatever where you can capture that? And then also, in external data and how we're monitoring. So is it again, like consumer reviews? Are there sort of like niche areas where people are talking about brands and experiences in more detail where you can dig in and look for reoccurring themes? Um, for example, for Spotify, we're working right now with Spotify and they're an awesome company. Their product is amazing. It does have some pitfalls. And if you start to really dig into some of like a premium users sort of complaint areas, you start to see reoccurring themes. So it then becomes a moment of how do we inject um, communications throughout the journey to help mitigate those problems. And some of them could be, how does the product change? But sometimes it is going back to what Mike and Miriam were saying earlier, it is as easy as, as easy as communication and really addressing the problem in the way that the consumer is vocalizing it and needs to hear the response. And you can sort of just sort of, you know, smooth that um, ride through the life cycle, if you will. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that in the fact that like, see, there's all this first party data, which, which, which customers have in CX, mm -hmm. you know, at the moment, I think a lot of it's kind of sort of uh, going to waste uh, because it's not being used because this is how you can use it. And it informs not just CX, but customer acquisition, uh, communication strategy, everything. Um, I think that's going to be a really big theme in the coming years. Yeah, um, it's all related. It all yeah. needs to be working as one. Yeah. So I've got, I'm actually going to do one other specific question and then we'll get to the theme. So we also had a specific question from Miriam. Um, a hot topic right now is using data to deliver personalized communications and experiences for customers. Um, where do you see this going? And are there any potential pitfalls people should be aware of? Um, I assumed everybody read my blog. So I, <laughs> I guess this might have come from one of your team members. This is my advert for my blog um, on personalization. It's a, it's a 
one of my passions, um, content and personalization are my big passions. But where is it going? Oh God, um, we, we are increasingly personalizing. Oh, I've got an echo, I think. You're right? Yeah, you good. Okay. So personalization, we need to start to be a little bit um, more clever about it, right? I think there is a danger that we are over personalizing and creating a funnel vision. I've, I've got a really bad echo then. Hang on. I think it's okay now. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so, so creating a funnel vision, so we need to get a balance because we can't 100% personalize. But where is that balance? Um, but big, big fan of personalization down to not just, you know, what do we show customers, but when do we talk to them? How do we talk to them? Uh, what language do we use when we talk to them? Because that language is so important. Um, you know, from a psychology perspective, mirroring, it's a thing, right? So uh, can we get to that point where we personalize to that degree, where we have a really personal connection with our customers on a large scale? Because, you know, when you've got a tiny company with 100 customers, you can potentially do that. Uh, you know, one, one man can do that. But uh, millions and millions of customers, that's really hard. Yeah, it can be. I think um, it's a really interesting, you know, area in that sort of by understanding how your customers talk, does that necessarily mean you have to talk like that? Because I, I, you know, I remember doing... Um, uh, we did a project which was age-based communication. So it's age-based reviews of mobile handsets. Um, and it's the differences in how younger people talk about um, handsets and, and, and older people talk about handsets. And one of the big differences in the younger people is that they're far more likely to use the word definitely. So you only know everything when you're young. Therefore, things are definitely amazing or definitely terrible. And there's nothing <laughs> between. Right? It's very true. <laughs> but when you when you looked at the differences, you also get um, the abbreviations of that. So the word defo, it's the, definitely in the UK at least, it's a pretty common um, sort of slang word for definitely, like so defo. But does that mean that Samsung needs to start saying defo, you know, to to, to the kids? You know, I'd say probably not. Um, that's a bit sort of dad at the disco sort of territory, but might be a tough sell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised at how fast language is moving as well. I never understood this, and and I don't know if you guys can relate, but I'm I'm a native Hungarian. I moved to the UK 20 years ago. I go home occasionally, well, maybe once a year these days. I don't understand them. My goodness, the language changed so much. They use words that I understand what the words mean in a normal term but as a slang i have no idea right because i don't live there i don't hear it on a daily basis uh, and i didn't i didn't understand that in the space of 20 years we can language can evolve so rapidly so then where does text, text analytics come into that when these words get created or these 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 slangs get created that you know how fast can you pick them up and understand what do they actually mean not just the you know the the, the word king in hungarian means it's superb it's fantastic right but as a text analytics, you wouldn't pick up on that unless you, you, you know, you understand, oh, that's what it means now. It's yeah, there's exactly. a new meaning to it. So fascinating stuff. So it helps to hang out with teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> Teenage translation. <laughs> so there's one more. Okay. So let's just go back to this um, common theme. So one of the, the, the themes from the poll was um, so better communicating with and making recommend recommendations to stakeholders. What, st what steps do you all use to sort of get better at that? And, and do you recognize the problem, I guess, as well? So I don't know, Megan, do you want to do that one first? Yeah, sorry, can you repeat that though, Ben? So I know exactly so what- I think one, of, so we did the, the, the poll at the beginning and, and a, lot of the, a lot of the sort of votes went for like problems around trying to communicate to stakeholders about uh, recommendations from the data and sort of recommendations on what to do um, and how you go about sort of communicating up the the insights that you generate. Okay. Um, sure. That's a battle for every day. So I think um, we, 
there is it, it's a bit twofold and so uncovering insights is a skill right whether it's from quant or from qual, uh, qual it's a it's a skill that you have to hone so you're making sure you're pulling out the most interesting tidbit that you can from from the information that you have um, the way to bring that up and make that compelling and have people really interested in what you're trying to say is to couple that with a second skill, which is data storytelling. So how do you take the thing that you found and how do you make it so um, interesting or compelling or different, and which is a lot of the way we try to approach client, especially if we're pitching, is like, what's the different thing that we can learn in this? Um, obviously still, um, you know, accurate or, you know, intellectually honest in terms of what we've learned in the, in the findings that we have, but what's the different spin or the unlock that I think if you can communicate a finding and, and say something to, you know, whether it's your internal or external stakeholders that makes them stop for a second and say like, oh, that's, I haven't thought of it that way, or I haven't, you know, um, considered that this might be the the context that this is the context that I was missing to the data that I've already had. That's the way you can start to, um, I think, push forward in terms of exploring that more. Um, you know, in our world, that always comes with some sort of testing plan or kind of you have to prove the hypothesis of what you found. Like, is this correct? But um, that art of storytelling is is you know the most critical piece I think of saying, all right, we've we found this, and then because this is a text, we, we have our quant, like brains always have that. We have this really intriguing piece of qual that's come out of text. Um, we think if we couple these things together, this is the really interesting way we can do, you know, innovate the way we're talking to consumers or find a new target or do, you know, whatever it is that we need to do in this particular instance. And to tell that in a really compelling way is the way to sort of motivate and get people to take the chance on piloting or testing or whatever the case is. Is that the same story for you, Mike, in, in Capital Group? Yeah, it, it's similar, except there's a, a mentality that I've taken to this, which is I try to treat it not like a pitch, where I'm trying to pitch them on a story or pitch them on what we've learned, especially when it comes to qualitative, and instead treat it as a collaboration. And so how that changes the way that you would then have the conversation is, you know, if you go to somebody's uh, a more senior executive or a senior executive lead team, instead of saying, this is the insight we've captured, trying to bring that life through life uh, through stories, instead start earlier. Say, here are some of the things we began to observe as we went into you know, this evaluation or this research or this assessment and allow them to experience it a bit and start to come alongside and get excitement and to raise their own voice about what they see from those early signals you were seeing as you started the project. And it becomes a collaboration where you're right. building it together and you can still guide the process. You're not surrendering your ability to guide to the end insight that you felt was most relevant, but you're allowing them to participate, internalize, start to advocate for their perspective. And we've gotten, I think, to a much better place by doing that, not just in the ability to engage, the ability to um, convince through qualitative data, but also just that sense of ownership and, and depth of understanding and how it then carries forward from that point forward. So trying to shift to more of that collaborative approach to digesting and applying it has worked really well for us. Right. And then I guess, Miriam, 10 seconds, agree or disagree? Completely agree. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I think we're out of time. Uh, we've got sort of 30 seconds to go. I, I just want to say like fantastic, um, heart, heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists giving up all the time. And, you know, I, I could have talked for another hour there. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, any questions, uh, you can always email us. Um, and we can follow up with any questions there. And there'll also be a recording of this available. So thank you very much for everyone coming along. Um, and we will see you uh, in the next Relative Insight webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you.